Hello creepy friends! I'm Britt and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be doing the reading wrap up and the update of my reading journal for August. In the visuals you'll be seeing me updating my reading journal and the voiceover will be reviews of all the five books that I read in August. As always, I will have links to all the books that I mention and all the materials that I'm using in the description box. And I will be doing my reviews roughly in order from my least favorite to my most favorite. If you'd like to see the video of me setting up all of these August reading journal spreads and doing all the illustrations, I will also link that video up in the card and in the description box. All right, I've read some really, really great sci-fi books in August, so let's get into the reviews. Counterweight by Juna. Read this if you're looking for a noir sci-fi mystery with corporate espionage, a fictional island nation grappling with colonization, tons of film and literature references, a story that the author originally intended to be a low-budget sci-fi movie, and translated Korean fiction. In this story, our main character, Mac, works in the espionage division of a Korean megacorporation slash conglomerate, LK. He was close with the former CEO, who has recently passed away, and now in the power vacuum there are various factions vying for the top position. Mac is part of the old guard, and his position is now tenuous. Meanwhile, LK is currently building the world's first space elevator on the fictional island of Patusan, a country who had a failing economy before LK bought the land and started building. However, the Patusan Liberation Front isn't happy with this corporate takeover and continues to fight for Patusan's sovereignty. There are also brain implants used by most people that record memories, and the memories of the old CEO are hidden somewhere in the construction of the space elevator and could be critical to humanity's future. Mac is running against the clock and all of these other corporate factions in order to find this crucial data first. I find it really interesting that the author originally envisioned this as a low-budget sci-fi movie, and that feel really comes through when you're reading it. It also gives some gritty noir Blade Runner vibes. I also was intrigued by the author, Juna, who writes under a nom de plume and seemingly keeps their identity a secret because they are queer, wearing masks during, in, during the few interviews that they have given. Unfortunately, all these facts surrounding the book were more interesting to me than the book itself. I was engaged enough with the book while I was reading it to finish it, so I wasn't bored. But it's one of those books that didn't really stick with me after I finished it. I did enjoy the style of the writing, as I mentioned before, it evoked a gritty sci-fi feel. However, I found the plot to be a little bit disjointed and difficult to follow at times because the characters' motivations didn't always seem to make sense to me. However, this could be due to some things that were lost in translation, and it's possible I wasn't catching all of the references and allusions. This book is very unique and gives great vibes, also reminding me of old spy novels, so I would still recommend you give it a try if you enjoy hard-boiled detective stories in a sci-fi setting. Breasts and Eggs by Mieko Kawakami Read this if you're looking for feminist literary fiction from Japan, expression of the pains and pressures of being a woman, an exploration of women's roles in society, how those expectations can suffocate you, and the difficulty of making non-traditional life choices, and a bold, direct, and fresh writing style. This book was originally a novella and a separate short novel, which were then combined and published as this Logmer novel. We follow the main character of Natsuko, a woman who lives in Tokyo and who has a middling writing career. In the first part, Natsuko's sister and 12-year-old niece visit her from Osaka, as her sister has an appointment for a consult for breast enhancement surgery. Natsuko's niece has stopped talking to her family members for the past year, and as this section continues, the three women start to face the difficult memories from their past. The second part of the book occurs eight years later and follows Natsuko's longing to have a baby as a single woman, looking into the possibility of artificial insemination, which seems to have been quite controversial in Japan. This section addresses the anxiety of growing older as a woman and the looming threat of infertility, and whether a woman can be complete without a child. 
Kamokami does such an amazing job expressing the pain and pressures of being a young girl and a woman. It explores how womanhood is defined and how those definitions and expectations can be overwhelming and suffocating. Kawakami also expresses a young girl's disgust and horror at the realization of the bodily changes of puberty and how those changes induce others to treat you differently. The second part of the book also addresses the longing to become a mother, but not wanting to be tied to a man, and how society looks askance at women making non-traditional choices. Kawakami's writing style is direct and fresh, pulling no punches. While I enjoyed this book as a whole, and the writing is amazing, I will say that book one worked better for me. It was tighter and more concise. Book two, while equally well written, didn't appeal to me personally as much, and had a few unusual takes that I wasn't sure about. However, Kawakami really impressed me with her writing and her boldness, and I really felt a connection and empathy with these characters. The author really examined some very complex and labyrinthine issues. If you enjoy emotional feminist literary novels, I would highly recommend this one. The Hole by Hiroko Oyamada. Read this if you're looking for a short, surreal novella from a Japanese author, dreamlike and unsettling imagery, feelings of the oppressive summer heat and malaise, a strange creature who digs deep holes that seem to fit a person's body perfectly, and visual allusions to transformation, loss, and disconnection. In this short novella, we're following Asa, who is moving out of the city to a small town in the countryside of Japan with her husband to live beside her in-laws due to a change in her husband's job. Asa is having a difficult time adjusting to her new position as housewife, but also has no motivation to find a new job. It's a blazing hot summer, and as Asa explores the countryside, she starts to have some bizarre experiences. As she walks a path along the river, she sees a strange and unidentifiable creature. She follows the creature into the tall grass of the riverbank and falls into a deep hole that seems to fit her exact dimensions. As the story continues, stranger encounters occur with the creature, and with her mysterious brother-in-law, whom her husband's family has never mentioned to her and seems com to completely ignore. This story was very enjoyable to read, being both dreamlike and unsettling. I've seen it compared to David Lynch and Hayao Miyazaki, and I would agree with that assertion. The author is very skilled at conveying the malaise of summer, beautifully describing the sensory overload of heat, humidity, and the screaming of cicadas. The imagery of the many holes dug by the creature, hidden and waiting, almost as traps for someone to fall into, was very interesting, almost indicative of graves. The men in the story are also seemingly disconnected from Asa. With her husband always preoccupied by his phone and usually at work, her father-in-law always gone, and the grandfather seemingly unable to hear or comprehend what Asa is saying. The only man she really interacts with is the mysterious brother-in-law but he is often speaking in riddles, and it's hard to tell what his intentions are. This story evokes feelings of transformation, loss, and disconnection, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. It is one of those stories that you need to just go with the flow and not try to understand everything that is happening, which is something that I really love. This is a book that I would love to reread to see what other metaphors and allusions I can pick up, and I just love the authorial voice as well. I highly recommend this read to lovers of weird and surreal fiction and books with lazy summer vibes. Toward Eternity by Anton Herr. Read this if you're looking for beautiful science fiction with a love story that spans across centuries, a meditation on how language and art shape who we are and how they make us human, exploration of AI and the ship of Theseus of personhood, a shorter book with a huge scale and depth, and wonderful diverse representation. This is another science fiction book that has such depth and breadth of concept and feeling that it's hard to describe in a short review. I've seen several others relate this to the works of Emily St. John Mandel, and I would definitely agree with that comparison. With its century-spanning plot and intricate connections between the characters, it is similar to Sea of Tranquility or Station Eleven. 
In this futuristic world, an experimental cancer treatment has been developed wherein a person's cells are slowly replaced by nanites over time until their whole body is composed of this technology, rendering them immortal. One of the test patients is Yang Hoon, a researcher who is teaching an AI named Panit to read, understand, and interpret poetry. One day, Yang Hoon blinks out of existence, only to mysteriously return a few days later. After this incident, he is troubled about the question of whether he is actually Yang Hoon or something completely different now. Panit's consciousness is eventually transferred to a body and allowed to live a richer life. As these humans and non-humans begin to live together and replicate, crises of existential proportions begin to arise. Who is really human? Who deserves autonomy and life? How are we all connected to one another? This is Her's first novel, although he has worked as a translator on many Korean language books, and that focus on and understanding of language is apparent in this novel. The book uses the mechanism of a notebook that gets passed on from character to character over decades and centuries of time to tell the story from multiple, f multiple POVs. Each character feels rich and relatable and provides an important piece of the overall puzzle that comes together beautifully at the end. This is sci-fi that is about what it means to be a person, to love, to exist, and to create. It's extremely impressive, especially for a debut novel and I can't wait to read whatever Anton Herr writes next. A quote from Toward Eternity. To write a story about someone is to create someone. What else can we be but stories about ourselves that we tell ourselves? In Ascension by Martin McInnes. Read this if you're looking for emotional and affecting science fiction, deep awe and reverence for nature and exploration, a book that makes you realize the interconnectedness of all things, hard sci-fi moments, particularly including the miracle of evolution and life in the oceans, and a gorgeous ending. This is one of the best books I've read this year, and maybe ever, so I'm glad that I found Willow Talks Books review on YouTube, because I haven't heard anyone else talking about it so far. This is a literary sci-fi about our main character, Lee, who, has a, who had a troubled childhood in Rotterdam and grows up to become a microbiologist. As she grows, she finds a deep respect for nature and a longing for the sea. She develops a single-mindedness for exploration and discovery, even to the detriment of some of her relationships, because nothing else brings her such fulfillment and joy. Early in her career, she joins a team going to investigate a deep sea vent that has recently been discovered and is thought to be the deepest in the world. During that expedition, she has a life-changing experience during a dive and discovers something that has never been seen before. We find out that humanity has also somehow found a way to travel faster than ever before, suddenly opening up the possibility of interstellar flight. Because of the discoveries Lee made at the vent, she is employed by a new NASA-type space agency that is prepping for long-distance space travel, and Lee is to research ways of using algae and a mysterious organism she discovered at the vent as a long-term food source for humans in space. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Lee becomes one of the astronauts for the mission to go deeper into space than humanity has ever gone. My summary here is so poor at expressing what happens in this book, but I don't want to give away any spoilers. However, the joy and wonder at nature and how life is formed and the things that humanity can do is effusive in this book. It is deeply emotional. Lee is a deeply flawed character, but I identified with her and the other characters in the book. There's a lot of hard science fiction, but it's also a book about humanity and about Lee in particular. It touches on themes of loss, family relationships, what we decide to do with our lives, and how we sacrifice for a greater purpose. This is a piece of science fiction that will make you feel the same way as reading Carl Sagan's words about the pale blue dot. I am not a good enough writer to express how affecting this book is, but boy did it make me feel. It was sorrowful and yet uplifting, technical and scientific and yet moving. It makes you see the interconnectedness of all things, 
This is science fiction that is ultimately about humanity and life. The ending in particular was gorgeous. If you enjoy sci-fi that makes you emotional and uplifted, this is the book for you. In fact, if you only take one recommendation from me this year, read In Ascension. A quote from In Ascension. In my mind, the world is not reasonable and can never be reasonable. It is much more interesting than that. And that wraps things up for August. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate all of you, and I hope that you enjoyed it and that you might have found a couple books that sound interesting to you. If you did enjoy it, please consider liking and subscribing, as that helps other people to see my videos. If you'd like to read my written book reviews, check out my website, bibliocreep.com. And if you'd like more book and journaling and art content, check out me on social media. My handle is always at biblio underscore creep. I hope you'll join me again. Next week, I'll be releasing my October reading journal setup with lots of artistic illustrations. And then the following week, I'll be releasing my October bullet journal setup. Please remember to be kind to yourself and take care of yourself. Drink your water, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.